Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and today we're talking about Biostar's H170Z3 motherboard, the Hi-Fi series boards. And this board, as the name indicates, uses the H170 chipset. So it's not the same as the Z170 chipsets we've looked at, but many of you probably already know the differences from our previous video on chipset differences. I'll post the table here if you need a reminder of what those are. So the H170 board is more mainstream targeted. It is not the performance market that Z170 targets. And to that end, there's no overclocking on H170. But that's fine if you're not an overclocker. If you're just trying to find a mainstream or business board, this would be something that falls within your search filtering. The Biostar Hi-Fi H170Z3 board uses a very unique feature. It's got two types of memory supported on board because the Skylake CPU actually supports both DDR3L and DDR4 for memory types. It's pretty important to note here that DDR3L is not the same as DDR3. It's low voltage as indicated by the L. And you could technically try and make DDR3 work in a DDR3L slot like on this motherboard, but there's no guarantee it'll work. It's probably gonna be unstable if the voltage isn't natively low and you're better off using either DDR3L or DDR4 and nothing else. This feature means that the motherboard is targeting a pretty specific niche. It's primarily aimed at users who want to move to Skylake, but already have DDR3L memory and don't want to buy DDR4. So that's very specific, especially because DDR4 RAM is priced at about 50 bucks right now for two sticks of four gigabytes or eight gigabytes. In terms of the specs supported by the BioStar board, you can use up to 16 gigabytes of DDR3L at 1600 megahertz or you can use up to 32 gigabytes of ddr4 at 2133 megahertz so no high speed memory here and that is a limitation of the chipset more than anything other than this the memory of course is a big thing the chipset's another big thing though with h170 you get 22 hsio lanes so with z170 you get 26 hsio lanes this means that there are fewer high speed io lanes available through the chipset to the motherboard and that means fewer high-speed I.O. devices can be supported. For a quick reminder, HSIO devices include Gigabit Ethernet, they include PCIe devices, video or otherwise, and they include SATA, SATA Express, and things of that nature. M.2 certainly is included as well. So for the features on this motherboard, there are two SATA Express ports, which can double as SATA 3 ports. So you can use them as SATA 3 if you don't have Express devices. There are four SATA 3 ports, one M.2 gumstick port, which consumes four of the PCIe lanes on the H170 chipset. So for the features on this board, the IO includes a gigabit ethernet port with surge protection, actually a nice feature on Biostar's part. And that basically helps if you have unstable power, it'll assist in managing the data transfer during those up and down times. So for the devices on the board, in terms of IO, high-speed IO and all of that, there is one PCI Express BI16 port that is wired for BI16, so that's your video card slot, obviously. And then there's a PCIe BI1 slot, which is usable for expansion cards, video capture, things like that, that are lower lane requirement devices. And then for SSDs, storage, hard drives, there's an M.2 by four lane consuming gumstick port. So it is a gumstick SSD slot that uses four HSIO lanes from the chipset for PCIe transfer of SSD data. And then you've got two SATA Express ports, which can double as SATA 3 and four SATA 3 ports which are the usual SATA device ports at six gigabits per second. Front panel setup has two USB 2.0 options, one USB 3.0 to the front of the case, and the FPC, the front panel control plug-in area, has an annoying wall around it with no labeling whatsoever for the pinout, so I would really appreciate it if there were labeling on there instead and if that wall were removed, but that's just sort of a weird older school design that Biostar has opted for on the FPC, and speaking to older school designs, there's oddly still COM and parallel ports, which are not really useful for US markets, but are potentially useful for global or Asian markets, things like that. Moving into UEFI and the interface, we're gonna show a bunch of screenshots of UEFI now. Biostar uses a DIP chip for its BIOS rather than an SMD. And the Z3's firmware visualizes hardware monitoring on the left side, somewhat normal here. 
and that includes CPU fan RPM, CPU temperatures, and MEM and CPU specs, which include frequency and voltages for each of those devices. UEFI options are also fairly bare bones compared to a Z170 chipset, somewhat expected though, and that's particularly noticeable when it comes to the locked overclocking functionality. Biostar has a one menu, O-N-E as they call it, and that allows CPU multiplier upticking to the turbo clock so that users can force an always active turbo boost setting, but no further overclocking is permitted. So if yours turbos, your CPU turbos to 3.9 gigahertz, it will allow a multiplier of 39, even though the reference base multiplier might be something like 32 or 34. Again, this is a limitation of the chipset. Overvolting is available should the force turbo require a voltage increase, and this is extended to DRAM overvolting as well for offsetting unstable but the limited frequencies that are permissible through the board. CPU C states can be disabled or enabled coinciding with standards, and the power limiters can be lightly tuned through the ONE menu. This is about the extent of the overclocking tab though, and we can look to hardware monitoring for something a little bit more interesting. On the hardware monitoring tab, CPU fan speeds can be set to smart, which is dependent upon load and PWM controlled, and the system fans are configurable to custom fan curves mapped versus temperature. So that's always a welcomed feature as well. Speaking briefly to the power and fan headers on the board, we were actually very fond of Biostar's decision to use all four pin fan headers. So you can use all PWM fans with no three pin headers present. UEFI on the H170 Z3 has a big focus on security features, which we can, we've been showing and will continue to show in these screenshots. And those security features include things like secure boot, platform key management, authorized signatures and timestamps, and things of that nature, which are potentially useful in small business applications, but pretty useless for the average enthusiast gamer or mainstream system user. For motherboards, we currently only do two objective tests, and those are boot times to get into Windows 10, and then a power consumption test, measuring the total system wattage. So the chart we're gonna show you for power consumption shows full load on the system using Firestrike Extreme, which is a 3D Mark tool, and that's run on the combined test. So the CPU and the GPU are both stressed. We use an identical bench for all tests on all motherboards, other than the board itself, of course. And you can check the specs on that bench in the link in the description below at the article. Jumping right into it, it's no surprise that the stripped down mini ITX board from EVGA runs at a lower power consumption than the other on-bench boards. That's largely because it's smaller, it's got fewer devices on it, a lot less I.O., and simpler chip logic overall, other than the chipset itself. Full system load shows the micro ATX H170Z3 operating at 318.84 watts compared against the mini ITX EVGA board, which was operating at 304.48 watts, and the full ATX MSI B150A Pro we've yet to review operating at 325.85 watts. Boot times show Biostar's H170Z3 motherboard as the fastest booting board currently on our bench, beating out the MSI B150A Pro by 0.93 seconds and the EVGA Stainer by about 2.93 seconds. The H170Z3 jumps to the desktop, that's Windows 10, so from off to Windows 10 usable in around 19 seconds after pressing the power button without any special features enabled in BIOS to make it boot faster. Biostar's H170Z3 motherboard has every feature you'd want in a mainstream board. Its security features are complete and very usable for small businesses that don't have ultra complex requirements but still want some security and platform key management. Its mainstream user issues are what you'd expect. You can do one PCIe video card, you can do one PCIe X1 device, and then the PCI slots will go completely and utterly unused, especially because the video card covers one of them. So those are just kind of pointless and only there to satisfy a dated standard at this point. So the board overall, there's not a lot we have to complain about. The only thing to complain about is its biggest feature, which is DDR3L and DDR4 support. This feature alone makes it kind of tough to justify the board because if you look at the market, you can get a Gigabyte ASRock or ASUS board in the same price range from $90 to $105 at the high end with this board falling at the $105 price point. So then what's, what's making the purchase worth it if you have a need for DDR3L is strictly the fact that you don't wanna spend an extra $50 on DDR4 memory. So 
at that point when you're looking at I really need to save fifty dollars, so I'm going to buy the specific board that limits my upgrade potential by limiting the amount of memory slots you can saturate. Well, that's that's a tricky situation. I would probably advise that you just save up a bit longer and buy the memory instead and do a full upgrade. If you want to split the upgrade, certainly that's your prerogative. The board is good otherwise, so I, I have no major complaints about the board in general. But from a value standpoint, you might get a little bit more mileage out of a board like the Asus or Gigabyte options, where you have a full four sticks available through four slots that are one type of memory. So you can expand to a higher capacity, and you might get higher frequencies if you opt for a hundred-ish dollar Z170 board instead. That's all DDR4. So that's the general thought on this board. No major complaints other than its main selling point. So if you want that selling point, it's not a bad board, but that's just a small market. So you should know who you are if you are one of those people. That's all for this time. If you like this type of coverage, hit the Patreon link in the post roll video down in this area somewhere in the post roll. We greatly appreciate your support. Subscribe as always, and I'll see you all next time. <laughs>